Professor Ronald Rael is the Ava Lee Memorial Chair in Architecture and the Joint Appointment in the Department of Architecture, the College of Environmental Design, and the Department of Art Practice in Berkeley. He also founded the Print Farm Laboratory. His research interests connect indigenous and traditional material practices to contemporary technologies and issues. He is a design activist, an author, and a thought leader within the topics of additive manufacturing, border wall studies, and earthen architecture. You might also know him for his art. Ronald, welcome. So honored to have you here with us today. Thank you, Christopher. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. Um, and thanks for that generous introduction. I might, I'll be sharing my, my screen and I might also introduce myself as a borderland citizen. And I want to talk about how in being a borderland citizen, um, I think a lot about the ways that people come together because for me, the borderlands are a place where people and food and culture and different religions come together in sometimes really interesting, sometimes violent and sometimes remarkable ways. But as a borderland citizen, it may not be the border that you're thinking of. And I'm, I'm coming to you right now live from a very particular part of the United States called Valle de San Luis which crosses the border between the states of Colorado and New Mexico and is bordered by 13 and 14,000 foot mountains at an elevation of 8,000 feet. But this valley was in 1848, the northernmost border, uh, the modern, northernmost frontier between the United States and, and Mexico. Um, it's also the headwaters of the Rio Grande River that connects us to the contemporary border of the United States and Mexico where it meets El Paso, Texas. The landscape here and the architecture is one that has been very inspiring to me. It's, it's architecture made out of mud, and you can see the remnants of that legacy in the landscape. Uh, but it's also the house that I live in, and it's a, it's a house that belonged to my great-grandfather's sister's family, and I still continue to live in it today. But I use this house as an opportunity to share knowledge about traditional technologies like adobe building and mud plastering. Uh, adobe making, which I share with my son as well. We do this roadside adobe project where we make roads, uh, adobes alongside the road. And I also teach traditional food ways, the building of mud ovens, ordinals we call them, and cooking with cedar in, in these uh, traditional ovens. What's also interesting about this landscape it's, is that just like the borderlands today, which is a landscape of, of conflict sometimes, this was also a landscape of conflict. And until and in 1845, this was all that was left of Mexico in what is now the United States, the part in red. But there was a militarization of that border as well, a number of forts, military forts and trading outposts that set up alongside that border, connecting people but also separating people. This is a fort in Colorado. It's an American military fort. It's made out of mud and logs in the same way that buildings are made on the other side of the border for thousands of years. This is Taos Pueblo, just on the other side in Taos, New Mexico. But what happens is that in these zones of togetherness and separation, in these borderlands, people and, and beliefs rub up against each other in sometimes strange and awkward ways. And I've been interested in this and, and the memory, how the memories of these continue in, in our history. And even in, in the 1930s, the governor of Colorado declared martial law so that he would not allow people from the state of New Mexico into the state of Colorado if they were of indigenous or Hispano uh, ancestry. And so he sent the National Guard to the Colorado-New Mexico border and at train stops to, to, to have check posts to make sure that people wouldn't be coming in to the state. And so those memories even linger till today and you might recall just not long ago, uh, our president uh, said that he was starting to actively build walls in Colorado. I don't know exactly where he was building those walls, but this is a kind of map of maybe where that was happening. So much of my creative work is, it is originates in the borderlands and, and I was interested very much in the building technologies of mud, which you know, my family has lived in for hundreds of years. 
And so in 2008, I wrote a book called Earth Architecture, which looked at how mud is a contemporary building material, but I was also speculating on the future. What is the future of earth and architecture? And so uh, I thought, well, maybe it's 3D printing. And I wanted to be the person who tested those ideas. So I embarked upon a project just last summer that I've been working on for really 12 years now to see if we could 3D print with mud. And so here's a quick look at that. So we created a, a series of 3D printed earthen structures that were based around several themes. The, the, be the beacon, which was illuminated by photovoltaic lights at night and desert. Um, the next one is the lookout, which was exploring how mud could be a structural material. We 3D printed the stairs right into the structure. And I, and I have to say, we developed this robot with an industry partner and it was a, a robot that we could just sling over our back and plop it down in the middle of the landscape and just dig mud and put it in the in the printer and, and watch it print. We also created a kiln and in that kiln we uh, harvested wild clays and 3D printed pottery uh, in new ways just as my ancestors did for thousands of years but using new kinds of technologies. And we also made one other one called the hearth and this is a it uses the same juniper that we were burning uh, both to cook with food and to fire the pottery to be a structural element to hold the thin mud walls together and inside has a fireplace where uh, friends can gather. While we were building these structures, we were incensed by child separation at the border and we were out here in the Colorado desert. Meanwhile, my friends in the Bay Area were uh, protesting child separation and so I wanted to make a, a sign that my friends could download that anyone could download really and they could use in the protest and I chose this as the starting point for the protest sign because it's it's a it's a sign with a super interesting history in the borderlands itself uh, this sign which maybe many of you are familiar with is a sign that was designed by a a Navajo graphic designer who's working for the California Department of Transportation. And he was charged with designing a sign to warn motorists that there might be people running across the road. These are migrants who were left on the side of the road by coyotes. And, and he saw this as a, as a really important assignment for him because he connected the plight of the immigrant today to that of the Navajo's long walk where they were displaced from their lands. And so he very carefully was considered well, who was in that sign and and he thought a little girl with pigtails would be someone that drivers might empathize with the most but he also secretly used the profile of civil rights leader cesar chavez as the head of the father so when building upon this work of what i think is a kind of subversive uh, activism that infiltrates california department of transportation i made one simple move which was to make the family uh, face each other and use the word reunite to think about them coming together. And my friends started downloading this and it was used in protest. But then uh, a curator discovered it and it, it made its way into the art world. And from there, I had the opportunity to bring that sign back to the highway in ways that I would have never imagined in the Four Freedoms campaign. And it was placed on an enormous billboard alongside the road to uh, bring to light this issue of child separation at the border. Uh, in the Four Freedoms campaign. And now you can see this uh, outside of the walls of, of the Cathedral of St. John Divine on 110th Street in New York City. And because I made it available to freely download, other artists are downloading this and printing them and scattering them out through Los Angeles. Uh, and recently it was the facade of the, of the Johnson Museum in, in Cornell. At the same time that this was going on, um, it, it, you know, well, this work is really part of a larger body of work that is included in, in a book called Border Walls Architecture, which I wrote a couple of years ago that is a, a biography 
an illustrated biography of the wall between the United States. And, and many people don't realize that there is a border wall between the United States, especially because uh, a current president ran on a platform of him building a wall, when in fact, two thirds of the border is already walled off. And so one example of the illustrations I made were illustrations that tell the story of the wall. And this particular illustration is a story that spoke to the kind of equality and inequalities that exist at the border, where the border is a literal fulcrum between US-Mexico relations. Um, and so not only drawings that I make, but also uh, models uh, of this teeter-totter. But uh, during this time, of, I, I think of a different kind of crisis, which was the, I, I felt like there was this, this national pressure around child separation at the border, the, the continued um, building of the border wall and the bans by our president, that I decided that maybe we should actually um, we should test these ideas and these stories and these illustrations in real life. Um, so we made proposals to work with arts organizations to see if we could install a, uh, a teeter-totter along the border, but we were always told no by the Department of Homeland Security and Border Patrol. So eventually we decided to see if we can smuggle art to the border in protest of the wall. And so we devised a, a teeter-totter that could be constructed very easily uh, we had it uh, fabricated in Juarez by some friends of ours. And this is how we smuggled it in. This is the wall that divides um, outside of Juarez to in, in New Mexico, Sunland Park, New Mexico. And if you zoom in, you'll see here is, the, here is the literal fulcrum between the United States and Mexico, the way that we smuggled in design to the border. Uh, the color pink was chosen. Uh, after a lot of discussions, because we had to remember that this is not only a site where we wanted to connect people together, but it's also a site of violence. And we, and we chose pink because in Juarez, pink is used to remember the women who were killed in the femicides. And, and so one Saturday we went down, uh, met with friends, and, and here's how it went down. I'll let you watch it. In fact, Border Patrol did come by and they asked what we were doing and we said we're having an event with the children. And they stood back and smiled and watched. The uh, Mexican National Guard came by and also inquired what we were doing and we said we're having an event with children and they stood by and took photos. And there was a kind of sanctuary that was placed over this site for a moment, bringing people together. And uh, in this act, we were talking about inter B earlier. There's a, there's a word in Spanish called convivencia, to, which means to, to be together, uh, to, to hang out and have fun. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm struck by a quote of Archimedes who said that give me a lever uh, long enough and a place on which to, uh, to stand and I can move the world. And I, I think for 40 minutes, we were able to show the world that the actions that take place on one side have a direct consequence on the other. Thank you.